Hello, this is Brian Foster on Kardak Radio, presenting the program Spiritism and the Spirit World Around Us. Hello on this wonderful June 17th, 2018 on Sunday. First, I'd like to remind you there still is a youth conference coming up in for the Spiritist Group in Virginia. Uh, it's in the, during the week of 4th of July. Please look at uh, Kardec Radio to find out information. You still have time to sign up. Also, we are here every Sunday. So I want to remind everybody that we are live Facebook streaming every Sunday at 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Uh, Pacific, all time zones in between and around the world. So please join us, have comments, email us, whatever you can. We always are welcome to answer questions about Spiritism because that is why we are here. Spiritism brought to you in the 18, middle 1800s by Alan Kardec. This book is so important. This is the headwaters of spiritism. He actually wrote five other main, uh, five, including this one, other main books. And, but this one is his first book. He, Alan Kardec wrote that. He posed questions to, not just to one spirit. Like, and you hear a lot of these things are valid information from spirit, you know, other spirits. But Alan Kardec was not a medium in the, in the, uh, in the sense that we use it. He was a, a intuitive medium, which we all are. But what he did, he, he, he participated in medium events. He got interested in it. He did a list of 1,019 questions. And he wrote those questions, and he sent those to mediums throughout Europe. And he only used what was in this book, the Spirits book, when he got the same or similar answers from different mediums in different locations. This was all given to us by the Spirit of Truth, which was promised to us as the Consoler to help us give more information, as Jesus said in the New Testament. Why did they give us information? Why was Spiritism brought to us? Because we were technologically and culturally ready, and Spiritism is a dynamic doctrine. It's not a religion. It's a doctrine. And we are being told more and more of about what it goes on on the other side, beyond the veil of the people call it the spirit world, the spirit realm, the spirit universe, all those things. The, the the fuzziness, the, 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 there's more and more information being given to us, starting with Alan Kardec. You can find his book, The Spirit Books, also. You can find it on the my website, nwspiritism.com, and you can click on his picture, and it will take you to the EDICEI bookstore. You can find his books and other books by spiritists, mediums, spiritists, authors, Chico Xavier, uh, Devaldo Franco, uh, Yvonne Piera, uh, and then... Uh, then Leon Denis, you can find them all on uh, Amazon too. You can also find on my blog, nwspiritism.com, you can find my books. I've written 14 books on spiritism. And what I've done is I'm not a medium, but what I've done is I've taken information from different spiritist writers and I put it in general categories so you can understand. I have one book, The Case for Reincarnation, all about how reincarnation works. Explore your destiny. How, what is the spirit universe? What is heaven? What is the lower zone? What is what, what, what is the dark abyss? What other people call hell, but it's not permanent. The problem is the solution. How, how do why are we going through the trials we are in this in this life? All because of past all past mistakes, past wrongs that we have done, and we need to learn. The spirit world loves us, loves us deeply. And now, in this book, is what I'm talking about now. I have gathered in a series of three books information from the Reverend G. Val Owen, who was an Anglican vicar in the early 1900s, who had a lot of information sent to him by multiple spirits. And it was just, and this this adds and and complements information from a lot of Brazilian mediums, mediums. So this is very interesting. And in this er, this episode right now, we're talking about how we are guided on earth, how humans are guided. And of course, you can find this book on my blog, nwspiritism.com. And I recommend you actually start with book one, which is Heaven on uh, Heaven and Below, book one. And book two is another Spirit and the Spirit Universe. So much information that was brought to us by the Reverend Chivao and, and his spirit mentors that talked to him. 
And of course, in these books, I take information given from Chi Bao Owen, and I also I also compare them to information given to Chico Xavier, Alan Kardec, other spiritist authors, Yvonne Piera. Um, no, I'm sorry. Yes, Yvonne Piera, and um, then also spirits through Deval Franklin, uh, Joanna D'Angelis. What, what do they say? How does that complement? How does that prove? And what I've seen is all these spiritist mediums and, and, and writers it's the same message comes through over and over again. And it's just like, you know, just a little bit different uh, takes on things, a little different shades. Uh, and, and each person learns learns the way they want to learn differently. So it's really good explanation. And it will tell you all about spiritism. And I see Hippolodo is here. He says, hi, everyone. Okay, let's start. How we are guided. Now, what does, what does the spirit, what did they tell Reverend Chiva on? You know, what drives our life and what what the spirit Zabdiel, who was a spirit leader of a group of spirits, he tells us that the arc of our lives is driven by two forces. Now, this is interesting. <coughs> Excuse me. So Zabdiel first begins with how our solar system operates. So he this is this is the, the beauty of spiritism is that really it's starting to tell you why everything happens, how it happens. It, you know, it's not just. Oh, you're going to die and go to heaven, and maybe you'll go to the pearly gates, right? It's not fuzziness. This is, you know, we're getting actionable information from the spirit world, and this is so exciting. So this is what Zapdile says. Out of the simplest wisdom are made the greatest things, and out of the most elementary of geometrical figures arise the most wonderful combination of perpetual movement. For it is only the purest and simplest things that are competent to be used most freely and without entanglement. And this state of affairs alone gives warrant of perpetuity. Whether on earth or in the vast reaches of space, through its goals, these worlds and systems, eternally because perfectly ordered in their course. He carries on. Now, it is not too much to say that the appointed paths of all <coughs> these bodies of the heavenly systems are shaped of two principles. That's where it gets interesting. That of the right line and that of the curve. Now think about that. The right line, just, you know, a straight line, right? And a curve like this. It is even more true to exact to say that the orbits may be said to be shaped out of one form only, and that is the right line itself. All go onward impelled in a right and straight course, and yet not one that is known to us but travels in a curve. Astronomers will explain this, but I will note one instance by way of example. The Earth, we will suppose, is set on forth on its journey. It travels in a straight line from one point. That is its potential movement, but it directly leaves that point. It begins to fall towards the sun. As we find after a while that it is moving in an ellipse, there is no straight line here, but a series of curves work together in one figure, which is the orbit of Earth. And yet the pole of the sun was not in the fashion of the curve, but in the right line direct. It was the combination of these two straight lines of energy, the impetus of the earth and the gravitation of the sun, which being perpetually exerted, bent the orbit of the earth from a straight into an elliptical shape. So what's he saying? That the earth is constantly moved, not only by the sun, but he's trying to make it simple here, by gravity, pulling and pushing it, right? So he says, and in, in, in which many elements of the curve enter to build it up complete. I leave out other influences, which modify this one. Again, in order to concentrate your mind on this great principle, I put it in formula thus. Two straight lines of energy operating on one produce on one another produce a closed curve. So what's he saying? He's saying that the trajectory of an object is determined by the energy within it and the force influencing it. It was out Without influencing forth, the object would travel on a straight line forever. It takes a combination of energy to produce the orbit. Zabdal explains the result. The result. This is what he says. Yet modifying the other and the greater dominating the lesser without depriving it of its essential power and freedom of movement. These, by their joint actions, exerted and directed, apparently in opposition, produce a figure of greater beauty than two straight lines, which are as parents to the child. Now, why is he telling this? Well, he's telling this to prepare to think of our lives. We are an object, even as, as a spirit, and even when we come in a physical body, 
where an object that carries within itself its own force. We travel out on a straight line until another force interrupts our course and causes us to be deflected. Think about what would happen to us if our life was frozen. No change in jobs, family, friends, and children stayed the same age forever. We would replay the same similar day over and over again. No outside stimuli would alter our thinking or our character. Imagine being in the heaven as described by many religions, where life is bliss. In the Elysian fields, where there was no want of anything, no stress, and absolute zero conflict. Nothing to ever bother you again. You would continue on in a straight line forever in time. Not that there is. There is no time in, 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 the, fort, in the spirit world. But you would never alter your course. You'd never grow as a person. It would be eternal monotony. Instead of smooth seas, our life is buffeted by high winds and waves. And Zabdiel tells us why. This is what he says. You see like an opposition of forces in human life, and you say his plan is here and perfect. You think he might have made a better way, and many doubt his wisdom. He's talking about God, right? And his love. Because seeing but a minute section of the curve of the greater orbit of existence, they cannot but conclude that all is falling, falling to destruction, or at least that a straight and a right line would be the better course, and not these combinations which curve the impetus of human life from its direct way onward of evolution without disaster and without pain. Now, he's absolutely correct, right? Right? Us here on Earth in our little tiny time span, right? Because after all, we are spirits. We are an immortal life. But when we are in this physical body, we, you know, a week is a long time, a month a long time for a child, a day is a long time for most adults, years, forever, right? So we, in the you know the political landscape, the, you know, whatever, you know, in our own our own our own failings, our own financial situation, we we see. You know, practically nothing good in many adverse situations in our life. But those situations that we think are horrible is actually a force pulling us off our easy path and onto a rougher but more edifying road, right? When we see a life cut down prematurely is actually but a course correction at the proper time for that spirit, all planned out in advance to make ready the soul, our soul, or other people's soul for their next earthly episode. Over the long run of our multiple incarnations, which is in fact a small portion of our eternity, the arc of our lives over and over again, right? Serve a purpose. Each existence is one more mile marker. Imagine going down the freeway. Every time you see a mile marker, right? You People... You know, you'll, you'll look at those every so often, you know, 123, 124, 125, or it goes down, right? Think of that as multi, each life. Each life is a mile marker, right? Each life is signaling a chance for us to grasp the opportunity to advance. Zabdal informs us how the spirit world from on high, how they see the struggle. This is what he says. We here, we here do not, we here do not see, not nor much of the road ahead, yet more than you we see, and so much as enable us to content ourselves and press onward, helping others on the road, content and trusting that all will be well ahead however far we go. For now we do not seek with much labor to reckon on the course we are traveling, wrapped around the earth myth, which hinders us to see, but we view the way from the clear sunlight atmosphere of these heavenly realms. And I will tell you the orbit of human life, as it works out towards completion, is beautiful too. So beautiful and so lovely withal that we are full often brought to a rest in wandering awe at his majesty of love and blended wisdom, to whom we bow in lowly adoration, not to be expressed in any words of mine, but only in the yearning of my heart. What's he saying? Each hurdle placed in front of us is there for a reason. It may not be apparent to us. I certainly know it has been apparent to me of the hurdles in front of my life in the midst of our daily dramas. But suffice to say, that is one small force that diverts us from a straight path onto the highway of learning and eventual perfection. And, and so what he's saying is, if you look at an arc of a life, right? Now remember, free will is always respected. We always have the, the option to, to make the wrong decision the stupid decision, the ignorant decision, the mean decision, the violent decision. We always have that right. 
So we go through life, right? We start off primitive, primitive spirits. We, you know, we fight, you know, we're mean, we, we want, we envy, we want revenge, we want power, we want wealth, influence. And yet these things are always telling up, oh, sorry, you better start thinking about what, what you would do to get power. What would you do to, to get wealth, right? We, we go through life after life. We start learning. That. That's where he says this, this is beautiful. This is, this is, this is, they're, they're molding us each in one, every one of us. They're molding us to become a pure spirit. That's why we're on earth, right? We're kind of like in an elementary or probably worse, like a middle school. It's heaven forbid anyone would want to go through that again, but that's where we're at, right? We're struggling with our emotions. We hard to control ourselves, right? We, something happens to us. We get mad. We get angry. But that's what we're being taught not to do, right? We're being taught to control ourselves. And you go through life after life with those lessons. And those lessons take courageous thinking, right? And the world, let's talk about that. We have to learn to think and learn about spiritism and study about spiritism. Before I start on this too, I just want to also say that when I have these Facebook uh, live streams, I put all these on on my YouTube channel, and you can get to my YouTube channel on my blog, nwspiritism.com. Go to the YouTube channel. You can see any of my past uh, uh, Facebook live streams. I also have like four, five, six, eight minute uh, videos where I'm talking about little, little facets of spiritism, you know, why we go through multiple trials, for example, um, gossip, the test of three, all sorts of interesting short videos. Please go there, tell your friends about it, share those videos to people. Because we're talk, trying to, to spread spiritism, why we are on earth. And it tells you, and this is why we have to, to study this, right? Because the world is full of religious and pl political intellectuals who work full-time, convincing us to stay within certain ideological boundaries. For example, we are told that the Bible must be interpreted literally. And therefore, the world must have been created in six days, even though all evidence points to the contrary. This sets up this sets up kind of a, well, I'm not quite sure I'd believe anything. But Spiritism tells us why this is so. So messages and books from the spirits brought to us by spiritist mediums tell us that the messages of the Bible were fashioned for the level of comprehension and society for the time in which the communication was delivered. Hence, the idea of a time span of billions of years and our planetary evolution would not have been remotely understandable to even the most sophisticated individual in ancient times. And think about the, the Old Testament, the many cruel happenings in the Old Testament. But they were talking to people that, you know, sorry, you know, okay, if you don't do this, we're going to swatch it. That's all they understood at the time. The New Testament got more softer, more full of love. And then Alan Kardec came with a spirits book, even told us, okay, this is why we're telling you about love. This is this is more information for you. Then came, you know, Leon Denis, Chico Xavier, G. Val Owen. They're telling us more and more because why? Because we are ready to think about it. So think about that. So you have the Old Testament, and then Jesus during his time on earth preached love and respect for all. But many still today cling to the passage as citing reasons to make certain groups outcast. Again, Spiritism tells us that the messages of universal love and fraternity are eternal, where other passages were meant for the time in which they were delivered. And the Spirit's Abdal, in his communication with Irvin G. Bao Owen, talks about the narrow parameters that the Christian orthodoxy imposes. Now, the Reverend G. Bao Owen was the Church of England minister, right? That's probably most in the United States, you'd be the Episcopalian. He was later thrown out of the church for publishing his messages. So everything he published in, you know, that I am referring to this book got him in hot water with the elders of the Church of England. So Zabdal opens in this communication. He tells us that even after things visible were created, what was left incomplete was mankind. That's very interesting. So he's talking about the creation of the world, you know, the evolution, right? The, the evolution 
Darwin was right, there is evolution, but he left off a part that the spirit world can, can manipulate it. And so humans are meant to evolve mentally to find their spiritual path for God. And to accomplish this task takes courageous thinking. So we were put in this physical body, but we're not, we're not straight jacketed like, okay, we're going to put you in this body and we're going to make you think right, right at the time. No, no, they're going to, they're going to let you think as, as your spirit, you know, once you're like 15, 18, your personality comes out. So this is what Zabel talks about this, about courageous thinking. Nor doing this, I'm able to constrain myself within the limits of doctrinal theology as understood by you. For it is indeed constrained and straightened so greatly that one who has lived so longer, so long in a wider room would fear to stretch himself lest he foul his elbows against the confining walls of the net, net, narrow channel. So he's talking about the orthodoxy, right? What, what Christians believe. And hesitates to go at any pace ahead, vain as he is to travel less worth than this be his lot. So no, my friend, shocking and startling as be those whose orthodoxy is as the breath of their body to them. More saddening is it to us to see them so much afraid to use what freedom of will and reason they have, lest they go astray. Mistaking rigid, rigid obedience to code and table for loyalty to him whose truth is free. What is he saying? We are being told that not to let the artificial boundaries of our society constrain us. Granted, this is very difficult where any perceived transgression unleashes the barrage of criticism from the left and the right. If any deviation of political orthodoxy is detected, in some countries, even the attempt to question religious dogma can lead to torture and death. So against this background, this breaking free of past, past constraints is truly courageous thinking. Now, Zabdal isn't asking us to be martyrs. He's requesting that we internally free ourselves and determine what the message of living by the golden rule, love, fraternity, and charity, honesty, really means, right? We should ask ourselves, what is the logical conclusion to loving everyone like a brother or sister? This is what Zabdal says. Think for a moment. What manner of master friend is he to them who tremble so at his displeasure? It is that he is waiting and watching with sinister smile to catch them in his net who dare think and think in error sincerely. Or is this he who said, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will reject you. Move and live and use what powers are given prayerfully and reverently. And then if you do chance to err, it will not be a willfulness, but of good intent. Shoot with a strong arm and feet well and firmly set. And if you miss the mark by once or twice, your feet still shall still be firm and the word well done for you shot a miss. Yet in his good service, as you were able to do so, you so you did. Be not afraid. It is not those who strike and shoot and sometimes miss the mark to whom he rejects, but the craven who fear to fight for him at all. This I boldly say, for no it is true, having seen the outcome of both manners of lives, when those who have lived them issue forth among us here and seek their proper place in the gate by which they may pass onward this way. So what he's saying is, don't cower and say, oh, no, I can't say anything. This would I would be ostracized, ostracized from the group. And even if you're wrong, right, and of course, don't never do harm, right? Don't, don't be one of these fanatics, right, where you're, you're being violent. That's not acceptable. But even if you're wrong and you're wrong about some of your ideas, it's not a big deal. It's the fact that you, you're trying to, to improve yourself. You're trying to find God. You're trying to... to understand why you're on earth and to do that study spiritism and you shall soon see the path to the light the road is not easy spirit being a spiritist is not easy what does it mean being a spiritist being a spiritist means that you know that everything you think is out there for everybody to find you know those who are, are afraid of all oh, privacy i need my privacy well you have none just get used to it all our thoughts emanate from our body. Everything is in the universal cloud. That's why being a spiritist is not easy. To take the path, one must shed old preconceptions, rid themselves of hate and envy, and begin to learn not only control their actions and speech, but right, right here. That is how you're really trying to, This is how starting to control your thoughts is really how you're going to ascend. You're going to ascend rapidly in the spirit world. 
No one is asking anyone to join a monastery or divest oneself of all worldly goods. No, a tougher test is requested to change your character and attitude, to actually live by the golden rule and to stay honorable in all circumstances. And to take this, to accomplish this, takes effort and study. Start, start today. Now, I'll we'll stop there again, again and ask everyone, please, go to my YouTube channel, look at... The, Look at the uh, the YouTubes I have. When you are at the end of this, please share this share this video with other groups in uh, the Facebook, whatever you, you can. Go to my site, NW Spiritism, and look at the books I have. Where this will these will tell you all about Spiritism. If you want to go to the Headwaters again, Alan Kardec, really interesting books. I mean, this is how I started, and I also want to tell you you can get. Alan Kardec's book, of course, all these books on the EDSCI bookstore and my books. You can also get them on Amazon. I have it in paperback and Kindle. You can get uh, all of Alan Kardec's books on Amazon. And what's nice about Alan Kardec's books is you can do it. You can get them the way I first got them. You can just put Alan Kardec space PDF and Google or DuckDuckGo, whatever you want to use. And you'll find all of his books on, uh, well, not all of them. But uh, the main ones that you want to read, they're on PDF. That's how I, I started. I read on PDF and it was just life changing. I said, this is what I've been looking for forever. But I do know some people, when they read Alan Kardec's book, it's it, everyone has different ways of learning. It's tough for them. That's why I started writing my books. So people can get into it one way. And, you know, here's these questions and answers. I kind of go through it a little bit more holistically. And I take one one kind of concept, right? And I also have books like like my old journey, right? The, the Seven Tenets of Spiritism, how they impact your daily life, how spiritism has changed mine, how I look at the signals and signs of what's going on. Now, more is talked to us, right? So Zabdiel even tells us more. And now in this latest communication, which was on November, <coughs> excuse me, November 19th, 1913, more than 100 years ago, he was talking about how people from all around the world will come to know about Jesus Christ. Whereas may not they may not know him as to his natural divinity, which I take to mean his composition and power as a spiritual entity, right? We think of, of Jesus as this nice, kind, person came on the world, you know, like three years of just brightness uh, and then dim and gone, right? But his message was there. The spirits tell us over and over and over again, Jesus is so much more than that. I'm not putting down what he did. It was just, you know, wonderful. But Jesus is, he, he was present. He helped create the earth as it is. He's present now. He is the leader of our planet plus other planets. He is always with us. He's always watching. He's always helping. And therefore, Zabdiel, talking about this, right? And then he talks, he goes, he also talks about him because of his acts of kindness, right? And, but that love, you know, acts of kindness, the love I was in human form, but that love is still there, right? And he says, the love is everything. For without the foundation of the feeling of love, nothing else can be built upon it. And that's what Jesus brought to us, right? This is really the difference between the Old and the New Testament, right? Is, is there's just there's more love and understanding, right? Don't, you know, don't look at the sliver in your neighbor's eye when you have a plank in your eye. Those type of things, right? Don't judge other people because basically don't worry about judging other people. You're going to be judged. We're going to be judging you all the way. And we're going to be, and what they don't say in the New Testament, but what spiritism tells us is that don't worry about it. Don't try to get revenge. Don't try to judge other people. We, we know every person. We know the best way to teach them in life after life. Well, this is what Zabdal explains. He goes, foremost, they must love. That is the first commandment of all and it is the greatest. And hard have men found it to keep. They all agree that to love one another is good. And when they come to translate the sentiment in action, how sadly do they fail. And yet, without love, no thing in the universe would stand, but fall into decay and dissolution. It is the love of God which energizes through all that is 
And we can see that love, if we look for it, is everywhere. The best way to understand many things is to contrast them with their opposite. The opposite of love is dissolution, because that comes from refraining from the exertion to love. Hatred is also of the opposite, and yet not the essence of it, because hatred of one person is often a mistaken method of expressing love to another. So what's he saying? So dissolution or apathy is a major problem in our world today. People have a hard time feeling. We are buffeted with shocking or pornographic images on a constant basis. We lose the ability to muster the energy to love. Hence, some take drugs or alcohol to supply the stimulant, the stimulant that begins to feel, right? Others become fanatical about a cause and lose all reason and empathy for different points of view. Hatred is the welling up of a primitive emotion. It is unfocused mental energy, which leads to the radiation of confusion and bad feelings through all around the person dwelling on hate. There is power in hate, but it is destructive and causes more problems than one supposes it solves. Zabdal also tells us that hatred also affects doctrines. Where if one becomes a member of one organization, such as a religion or a gang, then you must hate all other rivals. He, quite rightly, warns us that constant hate makes it more difficult to love, to love anything else where hate consumes all. Lastly, Zabdal notifies us that we must start with love, for without love we are unable to climb the ladder to perfection. This is what he says. This is one of the things which make it difficult in this life of the spheres, for not until a man has learned to love all without hating any is he able to progress in this land where love means light, and those who do not love move in dim places where they lose their way, and often become so dull in mind and heart that their perception of the truth is as vague as that of outward things. So this is a hard lesson, right? This is, this is hard. It's hard for me. I'm, I don't think I'm still there. Is Look, everyone loves their family, loves even their extended family. But do you feel that same love for everyone around you, right? I try. I, do, I don't succeed. But that is really where we have to go. It's like Chico Xavier, this, this great medium in Brazil. Not many people in the United States or the outside world know about him, but he, he you should read about his life. It's just amazing. And I quote him a lot uh, from, you know, the information he got from spirits in my books. But he was just, he loved everybody. Like St. Francis of uh, uh, of Assisi. He loved everybody. That is so hard, isn't it? That's where we must go, right? Now, it doesn't mean you have to be a pushover or you have to let everybody like, oh, give me your wallet. Oh, okay. No. You can still have criminals go to jail. You can still turn them in, right? But you should still love them. You should say, you know, hey, you should look at that person and say, okay, well, I reported the crime you did. I still love you, but it looks like you're going to have to go through a hard time in this life and probably some future lives, but you'll get there. You'll get there. You'll, you'll improve. Someday you will be a better person than I am now. That's the kind of, of love we should talk about. We should instill in ourselves, right? And your capacity to love greatly determines where you shall go after physical death. Zabdal doesn't desire any spirit to have to live in the lower zones or the abyss. Lower zones are like the earth, the centers around the earth from the surface up to the levels of heaven. The abyss is what we'll call hell or purgatory. Is Spiritism calls it the abyss or the dark abyss. And it's where you go, not forever. There's no, there's no permanent until you change your attitude, right? And in these in undesirable places, the common denominator for the people is the absence of love for others. The spirituality, God loves us all and has illuminated a path for us to climb towards goodness. It's not a steep path, right? But it's also not the easiest. That's why we're on earth. This is not supposed to be, we're on the planet of atonement. It's not supposed to be easy here. But it simply takes effort to rid ourselves of our primitive urges and to open our hearts to love and kindness. To wait one moment before letting emotions run over us and consider the feelings of the other person and what they went through. So it's not easy. So, Let's change gears now. So I want to go through um, something else that was told to Reverend Jivao. And this was on November 12th, 1917. And this is the type of information that it's just that all these 
this little points, little data points that we're learning from, from uh, spirits. It's just amazing. And this is what we've talked about now is music from the heavenly spheres. What is so what we're told is music permeates the spheres of heaven. It winds its way down until a crude approximation hits the earth, whereby it becomes inspiration for music, tones, cadences, rhythm, notes, melodies, vibrations on strings, and harmonies. One of the spirits, she was actually a spokesperson for a group of spirits that communicated with Reverend Shiva Owen. She talked about music, and she revealed the origin and the beauty of music. This is what she said. And this is, again, this is just fascinating. This is what she said. This and almost this only do we know or think we know. It passes for knowledge with us in any wise. The heart of God is the source of harmony in music. Not so much the mind of God as God's great heart. From him flow forth the love strains of his melody. And those spheres which are most near to his attunement receive those divine harmonies. And by them, with other influences combined, become more and more attuned to him who is the source of all that is lovely and lovable. Thus, as the eternities glide on, they who inhabit those far high spheres blend with themselves more and more of attributes awful and sublime and compass, each within himself and more and more of divinity. What is she saying here? So as the white light of love originates from God, so does the, var, the divine harmonies from the vibrations carried by the universal fluid, which is the, the core of everything, created by God, down from the highest to the furthest reaches of the universe. Why is music important? Because it's a catalyst. It, to, it re releases emotions and feelings deep inside. It frees our imagination to, to soar above mediocrity and materialism. The spirit Kathleen answering a question from Jeeva Owen about music in the celestial fields tells him this. <coughs> she says, yes, we have music of a like nature with yours of earth, but and there's a large but here. Your music is but the overflow from the reservoir of heaven's music. You do get the gleams of the glorious harmony we have here as it comes through, but it is muffled by reason of the sick veil, thick veil through which it all has to pass, even the finest of earth's masterpieces. What is Kathleen tell, telling us? She notifies us that we on earth are unable to conceive of the music in the heavens. Our physical and mental limitations imposed by our body preclude us from hearing the harmony from on high, but we do receive a shadow, a poor representation of what is heard and felt in the heavens. Now, in one of my first books, I talk about education in heaven. In this book, and Reverend G. Bowen's mother talks him about a whole college of music where, pe where people learn music and they learn harmonies and they learn how to combine it. And they learn how to transfer some of that music down to us. And that's why we've all heard the saying, music elevates the soul. Now, music serves to channel our intellect and emotions to a different plane. Music reaches places deep within our spirit. It helps bind our force centers together and brings them into harmony. It distresses. Doesn't everybody know that they listen to music and they feel more calm? And, in you know, of course, it depends on the music, I guess I should say. But usually, you know, music that you love it helps you calm you down and it, it just takes the stress away and of course this is uh, this is really what spiritism one of the the physical benefits of spiritism is and actually any real any type of venture into spirituality they've done many many studies and people who are spiritual or religious you could say are healthier and uh, live longer than other people why because our stress levels are down and stress does so many bad things to us because the more you understand why you're on earth and why bad things happen to you, it's not because people hate you, not because the God hates you or Jesus hates you. It's because they love you. And they're, you know, as I said before, that arc, right. Is it's just teaching you what you need to, to need to be taught. So when something happens to you or your friend, think about why, why did that happen? So, and without the power of our emotions, we stall on our ascendancy toward the light. That's why music brings out these emotions. This is why women who have had to experience life after life of hardship, hardship under unfelt treatment, who were still able to retain their ability to love and nurture, to rise one level after another, while men who block out and sublimate their emotional encounter roadblocks to fully unleash the power of their mind and faith to ascend. Music assists us to combine the naked power of emotion with rational thought. Now, 
Very interesting. In the book No Solar, which by the spirit of Andrea Louise, psychographed by the great medium uh, Francisco, also called Chico C. Xavier, he tells us of concerts in heaven. So even in, in this lower level, in No Solar was like one of the, the beginning levels of heaven. And then also there's other I talked about concerts in heaven. Uh, people, you know, and then in Nosalar, they sat on a nice lawn, they enjoyed nature and inspired music. And then in the book, Memoirs of a Suicide by Yvonne Pierre, it's a great book. In a city-sized complex to help and educate suicides, we were told that the spirit, Frederick Chopin, entertained the students. Now, the narrator of the Memoirs of a Suicide, Camilo Bronco, who was there because he had committed suicide, this is what he says. Thus, we were able to listen to the great composer who had incarnated more than once, always dedicating his best mental energies to the art or the belles lettres, as he translated his music via images and narrations in a stunning myriad of themes. So, this is in the spirit world, and Camilo Bronco wrote this book way, you know, this is in the, this is in the, uh, he wrote, he talked to Yvonne Pera in the early 1900s, and of course, now notice how he says in a, he's translated music via images and narrations, right? So this is like a show, probably even beyond well, like the sophisticated concerts, right? With all the TV screens and everything, and it, with you know he's showing all this stuff, and, and also then you know, Camille talks about Chopin as thusly because this is what he talked about Chopin. This is what he heard about him, an unhappy soul who now realizes that is only in the humble carpet of Nazareth, with the means of Jesus, that he will find the secret of the sublime ideals that will make him happy. He presented us with the dramatic poem of his earthly migrations and fabulous expressions of his enwrapping music. So he talked about all the different lives he had. Transported from the magic of sounds into the wonder of real expressions. One of his incarnations took place before the advent of the great emissaries before Jesus. When he was already serving the arts and cultivating cultivating it in an unforgettable as an unforgivable poet that lived at the very midst of the empire the rome of the caesars i don't know if he was ovid or what poet he was he's probably one of these very famous poets so souls who sense divine melodies and transform them to weave an edifying story occupying an important pedestal in the spirit world and in our physical world Frederick Chopin is one of those, right? He shall return to earth once again to lift up our spirits and help us turn our eyes and minds to loftier goals. Now, let's talk about another great musician. And this is interesting that we learn about their multiple lives, right? So when you read about a famous person, that famous person could be, you know, like he was talk, even in, they talked about Victor Hugo, right? He's been a famous author in multiple lives. That's how talented he is, right? Now let's talk about another music uh, composer, Mozart. So in the book, The Spiritist Review, Journal of Psychological Studies, 1859, which is a compilation of articles in a monthly magazine edited by Alan Kardec, there is an interview with the spirit Mozart who refers to the ambiguous nature of music in the spirit realm. So they asked him a series of questions. They asked him this question, can music in the world where you live compare to ours? This is what Mozart said. You would have difficulty understanding it. We enjoy senses that you don't have. Then they're asking, we are told that there's a natural universe, universal harmony in your world that we do not know here. And Mozart said, yes, it's true. You create music on earth here. The whole nature produces melodious signs. Again, we're told that not only in books by uh, Chico Xavier, but also um, Jiva Owen, where, where springs and lakes and fountains will, will, will set forth uh, music. And Mozart echoes what the spirit Kathleen told the Reverend Jeeva Alamon, that music is part of the environment, is one more aspect of nature. And during the same sessions where they talked to Mo Mozart, uh, the media asked to speak to Chopin. And Mozart replied that that would be possible, but they were warned that Chopin was a sadder, more som somber soul. And after Chopin was evoked, here's what he said. He said, do you miss your earthly life? And Chopin said, I am not unhappy. Are you happier than before? Yes, a little, he answered. If you say a little, meaning that there isn't much difference, what is missing so that you can be even happier? And Chopin answered, I say a little for what I could have been. Since with my intelligence, I could have advanced much more than I did. They asked him, do you expect to achieve happiness you miss now? It will certainly come, but new trials will be needed. And then Mo so the, the next question, Mozart said you are more somber and sad. Why so? And he said, Mozart told the truth. I get sad because I did not accomplish a committed assignment 
and do not have the courage to restart. So think about this. This is in the journal in 1859, right? The mental state of Chopin was documented in the seance in 1859. It was seconded by the writings of the spirit who committed suicide in the late teen hundreds in a book published in Portuguese in 1955. Spiritism brings us so much information and it's, it, it just, it, it, it reinforces, right? Camilo Bronco said, yeah, they said Chopin's not very happy. He showed us how he went through his life. That was book was published in 1955. In 18, 1859, Chopin said approximately the same thing. This is what, this is where really studying spiritism, we're just, we're just like, oh my heavens. There's truth here, right? There's, there's continuity here. And there's progression here, right? We're always being told something, something new. Now, so the music of heaven is, how do we get our music, right? So Kathleen, while advising us of the poor quality of the melodies that we do perceive, she expects, she attempts to explain how humans catch a glimpse of what harmonies manage to reach our lowly plane. This is what she said. Our business with you at this time is to tell you as best we may in what few words suffice. And some of what we take note of as this same stream depends upon us and passes onward, broadening to each molecule of the tone expands of itself and thrusts it fellows outward until by the time that stream impinges on your boundary has become much grosser and more coarsened in its texture and so suited to those almost tangible vibrations available in your sphere. The stream from above us finds a receptacle here and more than one receptacle, this is used as the reservoir and the music is molded into airs and melodies and started forth once again as a small but intense stream earthward. Immediately begins to expand, as I've already told you, and what you receive, therefore, is not sterling in essence, but the attempted expansion of the original creation. It is like a small hole in the shutter of a darkened room, though it streams a small jet of sunlight, but when it reaches the opposite wall, it is as much thinner in quality, and the stream is filled with dancing notes, which only tend to obscure the brightness with which it enters through the small aperture. So, she's trying to explain to us that we are like a traveler lost in a large city. Off in the distance, we hear what may be music we hear on earth, but it is difficult to decipher mix the noise of the cars honking, the engines roaring, the tires squealing. But still, a discernible melody pulls us in the directions of the harmony, which gives us comfort. Some of us, in a meditative or relaxed state, can hear the notes and use them to create an earthly representation of the sound dancing in our head. Kathleen ends with the subject by saying this, Well, but even so, your music is both lovable and uplifting. Oh, be thank you then, my friend. What must the music of these spheres be? It ravages us with ennobling pain and pleasure and becomes each in himself an accumulator of energy to give forth again what he has received, interpreted and molded by his own personality for the benefit of those who are not so progressed as he. So the exquisiteness and potency tempered by those among us whose special aptitude is of such kind, I mean, people who create music, in order that it may not be too fine in nature for the comprehension of those higher souls of earth who catch and in some degree retain with us reaches them from the master of music here aloft. So, hence the receptive souls of Mozart, Chopin, and others hear harmonies that rain down upon us in their minds and fashion, as well as they're able to, utilizing their native genius to compose music <clears throat> to approximate the sounds emanating from heaven. So, let me get a drink of water here. We are being told so many interesting things. And it's, it's, there's so much opening up with the information from the spirit world. And this is why I stole everyone, start reading these things, right? Start learning and look around you, right? So spiritism tells us that don't read the spirit's book, right? Don't read this book and say, oh yeah, I believe everything because I was told by somebody I should believe everything. No, that's, that's not how the spirit world wants us to believe. 
And, you know, oh, I, I believe in spiritism because, you know, I heard Brian Foster, I heard someone else, and they told me about this, and that has to be true. What all we're trying to do is we're trying to, is to put this information on the table available to you, right? It's placed there. What is encumbered upon all of us is then is to look at the world and decide, okay, why do these things happen? Why are, why, you know, why do people have near death experiences? How come mediums sometimes can foretell the future so uncannily, right? And I've said this before. This is how I found spirits when my wife had experiences and foretold the future was just, I mean, exactly. These weren't like fuzzy things. This is like, this is going to happen. And it did. It caused me to rethink my whole foundation of my beliefs. It caused me to know that, well, if people can know these things in those unexplained, uh, you know, unexplainable uh, happenings, then there's there's something more intelligent than us, right? If if a future, if if someone could say this is going to happen in the future, and this is like. She heard this like 30 years before it happened. She heard this like 15 years before we got married and, and things that happened 15 years after we got married. If, if, if someone can foretell something so far in the future, then there's someone up there pulling the strings. Now, that's how I, that's how I started getting into spiritual. That's how I found Alan Kardec, right? And I, I looked at everything. But each one of you, if you pray and meditate and, and tell yourself, you know, please, you know, God and Jesus and however you want, you know, however you want to meditate is, you know, help me understand this, right? Something, something will happen to help you understand. Either something will give you information that you'll have to think about and go, well, how can that be? How come science, because look, science doesn't explain everything. A, a true scientist will tell you that we know less than nothing, right? A true scientist would tell you, there's so many things we don't understand. And a lot of scientists are still religious. They still believe in God, right? Because they're, they know, they know that big bang, like that was a lot of, that was a lot of, of things that had to happen to make everything perfect, right? Even Darwin and evolution, they still haven't tied it, right? how, you know, how did, how did, you know, yes, okay, we started with this little soup, but then, you know, how was the eye? How was the eyeball made right from evolution? That's why I'm saying evolution is is true, but the spirit world suddenly will make changes, right? And so everyone should think for themselves of of what that means, right? There are things that happen to you. Maybe you felt your grandmother, you felt your aunt, your uncle, or someone else told you something, and it was like. Oh my heavens! I had, I had a friend of mine who who um, <clears throat> believed in the spirit world. Why did he believe in the spirit world? He believed in the spirit world because his father was a soldier in World War II. His father must have been a medium. His father was a, a soldier in the front lines. When his army unit would go out on patrol. He would dream the night before, and he would know where an ambush laid. And so he would his his squad said, "No, no, you're you're in front." And he would go there. Okay, no, there's an ambush there. And he would it, invariably there was an ambush. Right? They were they could have been killed, but they followed this my friend's father because he knew exactly what's going to happen. Now, why did the spirit want him to know exactly what was going to happen? because they probably wanted him alive for some reason. But he knew exactly what was going to happen. Then he had a dream that he was going to live in this house with this, like, white picket fence. He says, well, and he thought to himself, that doesn't look like Pol. You know, he was from, he was a Polish soldier that escaped Poland and went to work in the, uh, I'm sorry, serve, I should say, not work, in the Polish army in, uh, you know, when they invaded France. Because that doesn't look like, where, you know, any place I know of. Well, of course, when his when the World War II was over, he knew he couldn't go back to Poland because anyone who went back to Poland after serving in the Polish army, as far as, the, you know, on the Allies was, they were killed by the communists in Poland, right? Because, of course, Stalin was 
uh, you know, a typical communist thug and killed anybody who he was afraid of. So he ended up, he, of course, he met uh, his wife and my friend's mother, and they were given this house. And this house was right where his dream was. They thought, okay, this is it. So my friend, he's like, there's no question. There's the spirit world, right? My father told me he always knew where the, when the Germans were going to try and kill him, him, him and his friends. That's why each person, each person will will have this this little difference, right? This they will have this 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 knowledge of something which cannot be explained by what our science tells us today. It cannot be explained. Because, unfortunately, science today, and there's a lot of wonderful people, a lot of wonderful scientists, are pressured not to believe in anything in the spirit world or God. But look, for those of us who really think about these things, you'll start to find the answers. And I don't blame anyone for, for not believing in God. It's, 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 it's a stage where if that's where you are in this life, God love you, right? But think about these things. I'm just that's why spiritism, we're just trying to put this information in front of you. We're not telling you, oh, believe in God or you're gonna go to hell, right? No, no, that's not gonna happen. First of all, spiritism tells us if you're a good person, if you're a wonderful person and you love and respect everybody, you're you've dealt it with everybody honorably, and you still don't believe in God, you're still gonna go to heaven. It's it's not you don't have to be baptized a Christian or be a Buddhist monk or anything like that in order to go to heaven. You have to just improve your spiritual your spiritual life. Now, I will caution anybody who doesn't believe in the spirit world at all. We have been told by spiritists by uh, by mediums who talk to the spirits is that people. Right. So when I've said this, that you're a product of your mind, right? And you are who you are when you pass over from this life to the next life. If a person didn't believe in any life whatsoever and believe that when you die, you're just dead, that person will be hard to wake up when they are on the other side. And they'll have to work a lot to wake that person up. It might take years, right? They have to give them passes and they have to help them. So I would just say, if you know someone's atheist, say, look, when you die, just have a little thought that you know, there might be something else that will help them uh, greatly. But again, it's, you know, you don't have to wear certain clothes or eat certain things. No, it's the Jesus and the spirit world wants you to improve yourself, wants you to understand spirituality versus material materialism and wants you to be loving and kind to everybody and understanding that reading about spiritism, you'll understand that, the reason why they want us to be loving and kind is because as we go up in the levels of heaven and the levels of heaven just around the earth, and there's many levels of heavens further on the solar system, the galaxy, who knows, the universe is, right? The more you higher is your your power is immense. Your power is 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 more immense than any fantasy science fiction novel. Your you your th thoughts can create your house. You create your clothes, how you look. You know, as you go higher and higher, you create you create worlds. You you direct the evolution of species. You become immensely powerful. And why would they let anybody have this much power who can't control themselves? That's why we're here on Earth, right? And the reason we go through so much pain and suffering is because God, in His loving, His perfect existence, gives us free will. He lets us be, as I said before, as stupid, as ignorant as, as we wish. And we can take as many lives as it takes, right? Everybody will get there eventually. Everyone will, will become a pure spirit eventually. But that's the, the more you understand on earth, that's why we are given these episodes so we can learn from them. You'll, by understanding that, you'll be much happier. So again, I want to thank everybody. This has been a wonderful time for us to be together. I really appreciate it. Uh, I want to have everyone, if they can, please, uh, please share this video, right? Share this on other Facebook sites. Go to my YouTube channel. Share, share those YouTube um, uh, videos to other people. Show them where, where they're at. 
Tell them if they have questions, please talk to us. Read about Alan Kardec, read about Spiritism. Believe me, it will make a difference in your life. I'll put our end credits now and thank you so much. Thank you. I would like to thank everyone for listening to our program on Kardec Radio. And to point you in a direction to find more information about the spirit world around us, you can visit my blog at www.nwspiritism.com. That is www.nw, as in Northwest, spiritism.com. And if you are ever in the Northwest, I certainly would welcome to have you come to our meeting on Cambridge Island near Seattle in the state of Washington. Many blessings to all of you, and please continue to explore spiritism and the spirit world around us.